These light sticks. <laughs> Hi. Hi. I'm Jimmy. Um, I've actually been here for a year now. It's been a whole year. And it's it's been wonderful. I love this place. Um, like I really wasn't looking for a church. I was looking for a job. <laughs> And I, I got both, so that was that was wonderful. Because, like, as I'm going to share with you guys, I've I've worked and lived in churches my entire life, so it was it was interesting to me to like go look for a job, and then that ended up being a church, which I find was awesome. That's just awesome. Um, uh, so, a couple of things I want to say before I get started. Number one. Um, like I still like I've come out of Christianity a few years ago, so I still have a lot of like anger and resentment I'm working on. So I don't talk about Christianity very kindly. Um, so I just kind of want to apologize that because I realize that's still some of my own trauma I'm working with. Um, and the last few years working with social justice and working with houseless folks, I have I have um, accumulated a great disdain for how law enforcement handles things. And so I speak very disparagingly about law enforcement as well. So I just wanna make sure everybody knows, I don't necessarily speak for the UU church, even though I work here and I'm part of what goes on here. Today, I'm not, I'm not talking on behalf of the UU church. Um, I'm also on the board of directors of Mutual Aid Partners, which helps organize and put on the distro every Tuesday. And again, I'm not, so when I share my opinion, I'm not speaking for them either, okay? Just so everybody knows that's clear. Um, because I'm, I was born, I was born in a cult. I was born in a nonprofit. Like when other people talk about church, they talk about it's this thing that they went and did, you know, like on Christmas and Easter and every few Sundays, that was not me. That was not my family. That was not our life. Church was our life. And when I say we belong to a cult, it was like full-fledged, 100% occult. Um, I mean, doctrinally, the only thing that really separated us from Christianity was we didn't believe in a trinity, so that made us a cult. Um, but there was a whole slew of other things that were, that were not right. Like, for some reason, um, when my parents went to pick a church, they, they, they really needed something that just, like, beat the living heck out of them. They did like they like Jewish mysticism and Judaism. They use like the first two thirds of the Bible to beat themselves up with. Right. And then Christians, they use like the last third of the Bible to beat themselves up with. Wasn't good enough for my parents. Wasn't good enough at all. They had to like join some weird religion that crammed both together in this weird way. So growing up as a kid, it was so much fun because I couldn't do anything on Saturday, couldn't eat pork. And like once a year, you got to starve yourself for an entire day. It was so much fun, let me tell you. Um, but that was called the Worldwide Church of God. And it was, uh, it was a national, it was a, it was a global organization. I think in their peak, they had about 250,000 members. And it was a total doomsday cult. Uh, my parents, like back in the 70s, they lived in Pasadena where the church headquarters was. And my dad worked for them because he was an electrical engineer. He was like a super brain and he built all their video editing days for their TV show. And it's one of those TV shows that starts out with like scriptures from Revelation talking about chariots. Like they came and attacked us with these, these things that looked like locusts and sounded like chariots. You know, they'd have like an Apache helicopter shooting missiles and like tanks and nuclear explosions blowing up in the background. And that was kind of the whole the world's going to end and we're the only ones that are going to make it which is pretty much christianity in a nutshell but we were even like <laughs> even more so because if you didn't go to church on saturday you weren't saved like i don't i don't know about those people so that's what i grew up in um and when i was about i say about 12 or 13 no no i would have been older than that okay so i'm gonna back up i want to tell you guys a little bit about myself so do you understand where I'm coming from? So they get to know me a little bit, and then I'm gonna talk about the community stuff. So I was born, I was born in Wyoming, um, in Sheridan, which is like this little strip of, of like beautiful land in Northern Wyoming. There's like this little strip in Northern Wyoming and Eastern Wyoming that's really cool. And the rest of it is just trash. It's just mud and wind and just barren prairie. I don't know why people live there. I didn't grow up in that part of Wyoming. <laughs> So the first 10 years of my life, I lived in a town that was say about half the size of Grand Junction. 
Um, and it was, you know, pretty rural, pretty conservative. And then when I turned about 10, my dad got his old job back working for the church in Pasadena, California. So we moved out to LA, uh, we moved to California. So I've had both the experience of living in like the rural, peaceful, you know, place. And then when my parents moved to LA, you know, they couldn't afford to live in a nice neighborhood. So we lived in like really low income housing. So I got to grow up in like the hood and learn what all that was about for a few years too. Um, and then when we moved here, I was 15. And while I was in LA, I went to the church's school, like the church that we were part of, they had their own school. So I was like so sheltered. So for me coming out of that and going to Palisade High School, it was like culture shock. <laughs> and that was like the first time in my life I started looking around at people and being like, these people are doing all the things the Bible says you shouldn't do. And they're not dropping like flies. They're not, God's not walking around going, Psst, you're done, Psst, you're done. It was like they were just normal humans living their life. And after we moved here, and that was in 1990, so I've lived here quite a while. After we moved here, my parents left the Worldwide Church of God. And the one thing about the Worldwide Church of God I love to this day, and I'm so glad as part of my life, is like every weekend, the head pastor, the head apostle guy would stand up there and he would pound on the podium. And he would say, don't believe what I say. Go home, read your Bible, study it for yourself, prove it for yourself. And even though it was like a brainwashing technique that cults use, like you brainwash yourself, um, it sparked in me a desire to learn. So I've always been questioning. I've always been reading scriptures. I've always been studying Hebrew, Greek, all that fun stuff. And when we moved here and we left Pasadena, like a bunch of changes started happening in the Worldwide Church of God. They started becoming more like mainstream Christianity. And of course, that wasn't good enough for my parents, so they left. And they started um, building churches in their living room. And so for like my whole high school career, it was like every Saturday, it was like, you know, 10 to 12 people would get together and we would, we would begin arguing about these really super important things, you know, like, like what particular time of the day you were supposed to take the Passover. And most people don't even know what that is. Like, what are you talking about? But for us, it was like, had to be at a specific time of day. And if it wasn't on the right day, we couldn't go to church with you. And I, so I watched these churches grow up to about 20, 30 people. And then some little doctrine had come in and they'd be like, we can't do this. And it would go back down to just me and my family. And then they'd build it back up again. And then it would, people would leave over like the weirdest stuff. And then it would immediately go back to nothing. And after a while, I started really questioning it because I was like, the Bible says we're supposed to be like feeding people. The Bible says we're supposed to be clothing people. Like that's what the Bible says religion is, like in several places. But for my family, it was all about going to church on Saturday. Like they literally believed that was like the defining line between whether or not you were a good person or not. And I'd always challenge that. And of course, I ended up leaving. I ended up being like, I'm not gonna do this. I'm gonna go someplace where they do community work. And so, after that, I started going to World Harvest Church, which is now Faith Heights up on Horizon Drive. Everybody's like, yep, we know who that is. Um, and back then, it was like, it was almost like the complete other end of the spectrum because I, I grew up in like a really rigid, you know, you sing hymns, you do this, you don't talk in church. And at World Harvest, it was like, if the pastor was up there speaking, like five people in the audience would be, you know, praying in tongues or doing something, and it was just chaos. It was so weird, but it was also like a rock concert every Sunday, which just sucked me in because <laughs> I was a musician. I remember they had this guitarist come in, Craig Goldie came in and like he played some songs and he shared his testimony and he's just like a virtuoso guitar player and it just sucked me in. I was like, cool. And then the pastor started talking about how they went down and, and helped out at the, um, the rescue mission. They like went and did food there. So I was like, cool, these guys do community work, plus they rock out, and I can deal with all the doctrinal stuff I don't agree with because it's more important to be helping people, right? And that's what I thought. So we went, to the, we went to the rescue mission once, and then for some reason it got canceled and we never went back. Um, and I stayed at that church for a while. Uh, it's where I met my first wife. Um, and then her parents had a falling out with the pastor there, so we left and we went to... I went from that church to Valley Church, which I think, because 
the UU church used to be on Grand, right? Yeah. Um, we were the church in that building right before you guys moved in there. Um, and I was the worship pastor there for about two years. And I loved that church because it was all about community. Like they had meals together. They, they were really about, come, let us heal you, be a part of this. But it was so disorganized. And again, there was no outreach. They didn't go out into the community and do anything. So after a few years of being there, I just became really unsettled. And I, I went to a church out in Clifton. Um, it's called Faith Community Church which was just like a flash in the pan. It came and went, and then, it, and then Cactus Canyon moved into that building, I think. Um, but the pastor there was just like so on fire about building a community center for Clifton and a place where people could get jobs and clothes and all this stuff, which I was so on board for. I was like, these are, these are my people. This is my tribe. And I, I have to say, that was the first time a church got up and left me. <laughs> <laughs> Because the pastor had some weird falling out with, um, I think it was, uh, I won't say who it was, but some prominent folks here in town. And it totally destroyed the whole church. Like the pastor moved away because he couldn't deal with the conflict on the board anymore. And then they brought this guy in from Texas who, um, do y'all remember a few years ago, there was that pastor that went down to Arizona looking for gold and he ended up passing away. That was the guy they brought up from Texas. Um, and like two weeks of listening to him speak, I was just like, no, this is not my place anymore. Um, and I guess eventually, like they, the reason that he was looking for gold was he, they had become like a doomsday cult. And he was telling all of all the members to like, start buying gold and buying property and like building a commune for them all to like, exist in or something, which I guess doesn't seem that far fetched now. Um, but it was just so, it was so interesting to me how constantly I would get involved in these organizations because they, they'd talk a big game about doing outreach and then they never, they never would. Um, and then after I left that church, I uh, got a job working at Fellowship um, and I became the band director there for about five years. So I ran the whole music program and hired all the musicians and charted the music and told them all what to play and all that fun stuff. And in that whole journey, I went from like a complete alt-right, super conservative, like when we had school dances, and this was in the late 80s in California, when we had school dances, we were not allowed to dance with the black kids. Like it was part of our curriculum because the Bible said interracial marriage was wrong. I mean, looking back now, it's like it was no problem with, with me dancing with like the Latino girls or the Asian girls, but for some reason, the black kids, we couldn't dance with them. And there was like, there was one black girl in my class and there was one black guy in the class above me. And I just, I look at it now as such white privilege that the, the, the teachers would go over and like force them to dance together. Like, oh, but you're both black, you should love each other. And it was just like, oh my God. So that's what I grew up in, right? And then coming out of that, going to like the whole spectrum, like fellowship is what we call like a seeker sensitive church to where they don't preach doctrine. You're not gonna hear a lot of scripture. You're definitely not gonna hear anybody talk about Hebrew or Greek or any of that stuff. It's all just gonna be really surface level, more like a self-help lecture type of a deal. And it's meant for people who don't know what church is about. Like they don't, they've never been to church. They're just seeking, it's like seeker sensitive. And I have to say that even though I know, I know that if you went there today, it'd be a parking lot full of like Confederate flags and, and MAGA hats, I know, they were probably the most loving Christians I ever encountered in my whole journey. And it's because their focus wasn't on, like I love Jesse Duplantis used to say, like too many Christians are trying to clean the fish before they catch it, you know? <laughs> Like, so their focus was like, let's bring them in and then let's, let's, you know, talk to them. And they, they had other programs beyond that. And I just say that because there's a lot of people out there that I still love. Um, but now that I've like stepped away from it and I've really truly taken a look at what Christianity is, like, I don't see it as anything other than white supremacy. I just honestly don't. Like the whole foundation of it, the doctrine of it, the way we force it upon our children um, it doesn't matter how good and loving the people are in the organization. It's still a system of oppression that teaches people 
to think differently about themselves. Like all the racial roles we play in society, these are made up. Like somebody made them up. Being white is a made up pretend role. It's pretend, it's a fiction that we're all conditioned to live just because of the color of our skin. And it's so crazy to me when you step away from it and you see how much it influences our behavior. You see how much it influences how we approach other people. And it just, it's like, I can't, I can't, like, I can't set foot in a Christian church anymore because just like Jesus, I'd either be running them out with a whip or they'd be kicking me out. <laughs> um, so that, that kind of, in a nutshell, explains like where I've come from. I've come from like a really conservative background. I've done a lot of work on myself. Um, I think God's done a lot of work on me. And I really like the person that I've turned into. I really like the person that I've become. Because um, I, I grew up with a ton of childhood trauma. Like when you grow up in a really authoritarian Christian household, any question, any like deviance from obedience becomes like a severe punishment, right? Because you believe in a God that's like, oh, well, you ate fruit on the wrong day of the week. I got to kill you. I mean, that's Christianity. So you have parents that raise their kids in that. And it's the same thing. It's like, oh, you were, you were up reading a book I didn't want you to on Friday night. Well, it's a spanking. And with my parents, the spanking just wasn't like a ch -ch -ch, have fun. Um, my mom used to like, my mom had this little belt that was like coiled up in her top drawer like a snake, you know? And if I was really bad, she'd make me go get it. And then she'd like get the thing out and it was just like this thin little belt. It was like thick though. It was like somebody's old broken belt. And she would like take my pants down and she'd have to hold me by one arm and like spank me in a circle. Cause I'd like, I wouldn't stop moving. I'd be like dancing and jumping all around her. And so, when you grow up in an environment like that, you, you tend to have like a trauma response to pretty much anything in life. And it created in me, um, like I really do, I really, I have a real problem um, just being around humans, just being in a room full of humans where I have to like interact with them. It's kind of why I like just hiding in the sound booth and then just kind of coming out and saying hi to a few people afterwards and then I go home. <coughs> And I, I'm saying that just so that it, so you can know me a little better, that if you come into church and I'm just like, hi, and I just run off, there's nothing to do with you. <laughs> it's just my trauma response. I'm like, I can't interact with this person and I'm terrified. So I'm going to go find something to do so I can calm myself down. Um, because it, it did, it raised me up into this, like, I am terrified of everything. Like you name something, I'm terrified of it doesn't matter what it is. I can think of 10 reasons why we should be just stark raving mad about something going on. Like in my mind, 24 seven, it's like red alert, shields up, DEFCON one, like the Russians have launched the missiles and they're on their way and there's nothing we can do. That's like how I live 100% of the time. But here's the crazy thing. You wanna hear something really crazy? In 2014, they did a study, and most of you guys know this, of what the biggest fear people have is. Like the number one fear humans have. Does anybody know? Public speaking. You put a microphone in my hand, you stick me in front of people, I will not shut up. <laughs> like, I have no fear right now. I mean, I'm a little nervous. I haven't done this in a while, but at the same time, it's like, this feels so natural to me. I can't explain just how good this feels. And it's so weird to me, because I go through the rest of my life like, and I get up here and it's just like, hey, how's it going? It's great. I don't know why that is. I think it's interesting. Just wanted to share that with you so you know a little bit more about me. Um, so after I left Christianity um, and met my second wife, um, who is a total like pagan witch, like she is like <laughs> crystals, tarot cards, the whole nine yards. And I, I love her to death. She's amazing. Um, but she introduced me to a, a group of individuals and we do like spiritual practice. Like we went and sat like a Vipassana, which is like a, it's like a Buddhist practice where you sit for, you sit for days and complain <laughs> about how much it hurts. And then one day you're like, oh my God, this is so great. I can't explain it. It just happens. Um, 
So outside of Christianity, I started journeying through a lot of different modalities, a lot of different ideas, and I, I found um, a couple spiritual mentors that I really like. And about four, I guess about four or five years ago now, um, Alchemy and I are driving back from Denver and we're listening to this, this recording of what they, it's like a, just like a call in. It was during the pandemic, like right when the pandemic was starting. So they were doing it over a Zoom call because they'd normally do these in, in person. But it was just a normal, um, they call it like a semi-private, sorry. And it's just like a normal thing, you know, like you've seen it, humans go to see like Esther Hicks or something and it's just normal like human questions, right? People get on the call and they're asking, how can I find love? How can I make more money? How can I enjoy my time? How can my life be more fulfilling? And we're, you know, we're listening to it and talking and this black woman, this older black woman gets on and she says, she says, I have a question about race, racial tensions in my country. And she starts listing um, some events that had happened. She starts with George Floyd. I think this might've been right around when Breonna Taylor happened. And a couple more that I'd heard of. And she says a couple more, and a couple more, and a couple more. And I hadn't heard of any of these things happening like racial injustice being done on black people, people of color, and she just keeps going and going. And finally, she breaks down just weeping in anguish, just groaning. I, I wasn't even a cry. It was like, it was like listening to someone just wail because they were in so much pain. They just couldn't form the words to say it. And in that moment, listening to her, something in me just broke. Like it broke my heart into a million pieces. And I just sat there listening to this woman cry. And my spiritual mentor comes on and he says, what you're hearing right now is generations of anguish, generations of injustice that are coming out of this woman and us giving her the space to safely wail and share this anguish is actually healing for her. And I remember thinking in that moment that I don't, however I put myself back together after this, I don't want it to be anything like I was. Because in that moment, I realized a black life did not matter to me as much as a white life did. I can't tell you why. I mean, I know it's from like my past and my programming, but it just seems so stupid to believe something like that. But there it is in the back of my mind, like a splinter. And when I got home, the first thing I did was called up my friend, David Hood, who was like one of the only black people I knew in this town, because most of them have moved away. I mean, this place is a racist cesspool. It is, it is. And I called him up and I was like, what can I do? What can I do? And he said, nine o'clock, Tuesday morning. You, you parking lot. That was his answer. Like, I, from what I understand, like the black community, they don't like marching and, and doing all that stuff. It just doesn't, that does not create the change. That does not create lasting change. Running around, throwing bricks at welding, buildings, burning stuff. It doesn't create the lasting change that we really want to see in our communities. It needs to be a heart change. It has nothing to do with laws or, or, I mean, sure, we could pass a law, right? The white people can't use the N-word. We could pass that law. And people could rant and rave that it's protected by freedom of speech or whatever. But it, like for me, I don't wanna pass a law like that. I wanna go out into my community and change hearts so that a white person in this community doesn't reach for that tool when they're talking about a person of color. And that takes a heart change. That takes a change in here, not just something on paper, not something we vote for, not something that we yell and scream about on the street corner. It's just a change of how we live life and how we prioritize things. And so in answer to my friend David, I started helping out. I started helping out on Tuesdays. And for the first time in my life, I didn't show up in that like Christian, oh, I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna do some good kind of vibe, you know? 
I, I showed up and I was like, I'm gonna sit back and wait till people ask me for help. I'm gonna sit back and wait and see where my help is needed and where I can just support what's going on. And we were doing food boxes and the food boxes had to be organized and it was just like this disarray. And I thought, well, I can do that. So I started helping out with the food boxes and organizing that. And then after a few months, they asked me if I wanted to be on the board of directors. And then they asked me if I wanted to be the lead organizer for the distro. And I was happy. I was really happy to take on those roles. It's what I wanted to do from the beginning, but I knew it had to happen organically. And I knew I needed to not just come in as like a white male and like force my, my way into it, which is so easy. It's so easy for a white man to walk into a room and take charge. And once you start noticing how easy it is, as a, my, myself personally, like I walk into rooms now and I'm like, I'm gonna go stand in the corner and see what happens. And it's been so eye-opening. I remember one time I was at Community Food Bank and we were, we were just touring the facility and they had a new employee, was this Latina woman. And every time we would circle up, she would stand outside of the circle. And like the, the, the director would always be like, oh, Mary, would you come be part of the circle and share your input? And she would like very timidly like come into the circle. And it happened like two or three times. And I remember thinking to myself, like if I hadn't had this attitude of like stepping back and observing what was happening, I would have never seen this woman. I would have never even noticed she was there. In fact, in my mind, I probably would have been like, well, you know, if she wants a place at the table, she needs to have some confidence, right? But I see now that there are so many marginalized people in our society. There are so many people who feel afraid to even have a voice. They're terrified of even speaking up about what they want. And we live in this culture that's like, well, if you don't speak up, you don't get it. And I want to change that. I want to change that so bad. So whenever we, we talk about things on the parking lot on Tuesday, the thing that I'm always pushing is be looking. Look for Black, Indigenous people of color. Look for disabled folks. Look for the LGBTQ folks that show up. Because those are the ones that are so marginalized, they feel like they don't even have a place. They feel like they don't even belong. They don't even know where to begin to be a part of something. And so when we do community work, that's why like diversity and, and inclusion trainings are so important because it trains us to look for marginalized folks instead of the old way of thinking in America where we're looking for the people who shine the brightest and the people with the most potential. Like, those people are fine, they'll take care of themselves. There are a ton of nonprofits in this town who are great at helping people who can help themselves. There are, there's a bunch of them and I'm so thankful for them. But the folks we see on Tuesday, those are the folks, they don't fit in anywhere. They don't fit in at Homeward Bound. They don't fit in at Catholic Outreach. They have no place to go. They have no one giving them food or essentials. Because again, in our culture, in our society, we are trained to ignore them and somehow blame them for being where they're at. And that's what I want to change. That's what I want to change about my community. It's what I want to change about the town that I've lived in for 30 years and kept talking about doing something, but never did. So that's why I've started these classes, because I also understand that when we start volunteering, we may not have the skill set. Like if, like if you see a houseless person who's you know, having a, a manic episode, like one of my dear friends who's around the church a lot, he just got arrested last Friday and he's incarcerated. Um, and I know it's just because he had an episode and didn't know how to control himself. And of course the cops show up and they're like, well, if you're not gonna listen to me, I'm gonna take you to jail. And it's just this, it's this horrible cycle. And when you do street work, it's so fatiguing to watch it happen over and over and over again. So today's message is about me asking for help because I can't do it all on my own. And even with the volunteers out there, we can't do it with just 20 or 30 of us every week. It is gonna take our entire community coming together to do something about this. And with these classes, I wanna empower you to be able to have de-escalation techniques. Well, what is de-escalation? It's when some, you come up to somebody and they're escalated and you help them come back down. And we teach things like nonviolent communication because it really helps when you walk up to somebody and they're mad and they're angry. Of course they are. They didn't have a bed to sleep in. 
They didn't have a bathroom to get up and sit on their phone while they took care of themselves in the morning. They didn't have a shower. They didn't have a place to cook their breakfast. They didn't have a haircut. They don't have a place to even wash their clothes. Don't you think you'd be mad if like you got up in the morning, like you had nothing, you had to show up and deal with some people and yeah. These people need a ton of love and a ton of grace and they need a community that's willing to accept them and give them a safe space just to be, just to exist. So I think we took a break from the classes this month because we have the new dimension stuff coming on. Um, but the first and third Thursdays of the month is what we're doing from now on. So if you want to come get training on how to help your community, the first and third Thursdays of the month, we'll have training here for you. Sometimes it'll just be me. Sometimes it'll be a video. Sometimes we'll bring in other speakers. But again, I want I want to teach people all the skills I've learned over the past couple of years because it's completely changed how I view things. And I understand because of my male privilege, I don't, I don't have as much fear talking to houseless folks or going into camps as you know some women do, which I totally understand, which is again why, why I want to teach people so nobody has to do it alone. It's not just you going out into the camps or you showing up on a Tuesday. It's you and a group of community individuals people who really care. Uh, I'm gonna leave you with this last thing. It's, it's something that really changed my mind about how to view society. But there's this um, quote from Dr. Martin Luther King, and I'm, I'm just gonna paraphrase it. I'm not gonna get the quote perfectly, but if I take a knife and I stab you with that knife and I let go, so I'm not stabbing you anymore, but the knife is still in the wound, is it gonna heal? No. If I take the knife like halfway out and just hold it there, I mean, I'm not stabbing you anymore. Look, look at all the progress. I've taken it halfway out. Is the wound gonna heal? No. If I take that knife almost all the way out and I just leave it in just a little bit, I mean, come on, we had a black president, right? We have a black vice president. We have the Civil Rights Act. We have the Fair Housing Act, right? Healing has not even begun in the communities of Black, Indigenous people of color because we have not stopped oppressing them. We have not stopped stabbing them. And until we do, until the knife comes completely out, gets put on the counter, and we, as white America, start creating healing spaces and ways for Black, Indigenous people of color to heal, that healing will never start. And it will always be opposition. There will always be odds between us. And I say us again, referring back to the pretend roles that society has created for all of us. All right? All right, thank you all so much for letting me come and talk today. I was gonna try and have time for Q&A, but like I said, you put a microphone in my hand and I never shut up. So <laughs> I'm gonna say thank you, I'm gonna hand it over back to Wendy.